Well, welcome everybody. <clears throat> this is the tenth lecture in my course on tranquility and insight in early Buddhist discourse. I think like this better, no? First of all, again, I am going through some of the comments in the blog. There was um, Friedgard Lottermoser, alias Sister Kinchener, and she had asked about the Anguttara Nikaya in comparison with the Ekotrika Agami. She said, We refer to the absence of Chinese parallels from any suttas of the Anguttara Nikaya. I'm interested to hear more on that. Is the list of discourses in Anguttara Nikaya available that are not found in Chinese? And what about the Samyutta Nikaya? Yeah, so the, uh, this is something that has to do with this whole transmission history of the Agamas. For the Anguttara Nikaya, the only full-fledged parallel that we have preserved in Chinese translation, the Ekotrika Agama, this is a somewhat complex situation. The version we have now in Chinese translation does not seem to be 100% an authentic record of the Indic original. And in a paper at present under publication, I have been able to show that a whole discourse was added to this collection only in China. And in general, the Ekotrika Agama shows substantial differences from the Anguttara Nikai of the Theravada version, but also from uh, as much as we have preserved Sanskrit fragments of the Sarvastivada version. So the situation when we have a discourse in the Anguttara Nikaya that has not a parallel in the Ekotrika Agama, this is even less surprising than with the other collections. I think I mentioned before that the fact that a Pali discourse does not have a parallel is in itself not conclusive anyway. But this is all the more the case for the Anguttara Nikaya. With the Samyutta Nikaya, which uh, Friedgard slash Akinchana mentioned, the situation is quite different. The Samyutta Nikaya and the Samyukta Agama, of which I am at present doing a serialized translation, are fairly similar to each other. Yes, so there's a lot of overlap. Still, we sometimes get a discourse in the one or the other collection, which is not found in the parallel version, but uh, they are much closer to each other. So in, in very general terms, but this should really be taken in a very general terms, my feeling is that in the case of the Diga Nikaya and the Dirga Agama uh, Dharma Guptaka version and Samyutta Nikaya and Samyukta Agama Mula Savastivada version, we have a lot of correspondence. In the case of the Majjhima Nikaya and the Madhyama Agama of the Savastivada version, there are more substantial differences not so much in the actual discourses, but in the overall conception of the collection. The Madhyama Agama has many more discourses, and many of these discourses in the Pali Canon are found in the Anguttara or Samyutta Nikaya. But the collections that really are quite radically different here are the Anguttara Nikaya and the Ekotrika Agama. And it is a matter of interpretation or perhaps also of future research to be conducted to see how far, to what extent, this actually reflects different collections in India. Or, and this is my personal suspicion to a considerable degree, also a problem uh, surrounding the Chinese translation of this work. So, now we get into meditation. This was something from Robert Grosh, and this was on this whole issue of um, mindfulness of breathing and the third step, <clears throat> how to interpret the significance of the third step. I have abbreviated a little bit. Oh, I think it got in all, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> Robert Grosh. I do not think... This is in contradiction to experiencing the breath as a phenomena that takes place in the whole body. 
In my view, these are merely two different approaches to the same thing. First, it is a medical fact that all components of the body are connected by the fascia system, system of connective tissue that embraces muscles, inner organs, etc., and also connects to the bones. One method physical therapists use to evaluate the degree of relaxation of the body is to measure, by touch and vision, how far the breath travels. If the body is quite relaxed, the breath can be felt at the calves and the feet. Secondly, it just so happens, in my case, that broadening of awareness and calming of the mind leads to widening of the scope of awareness, which is then able to see the breath happening in the whole body. The relaxation of the body accompanies the relaxation of the mind. If this happens, naturally the breath remains to be the meditation object. Yeah, and this is something new to me. I was not aware of this uh, uh, fact that it is apparently a medical fact that one can feel breath throughout the whole body. I thought always that was a, more like a, 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 an idea that some people have. And I find this is a very beautiful way of matching or leading over from the one interpretation to the other, the interpretation that uh, is proposed in Visuddhimag and the commentarial tradition according to which the third step of mindfulness of breathing refers to the whole body of the breath. And this is also followed by many meditation teachers, and it's certainly a very meaningful interpretation. And the other interpretation, which uh, uh, personally I find the more probable one based on comparative studies, last time I said that in the Mahasangika Vinaya, the parallel version, of the 16 steps of mindfulness of breathing really speaks of the whole body of pervading it. According to which the third step of mindfulness of breathing is a broadening of awareness uh, that becomes aware of the whole body. So we can bring these two together and each one can choose on what uh, aspect of this uh, experience of the breath pervading the whole body one would prefer to focus during <coughs> meditation practice. <clears throat> this is from Manfred Wiesberger. How does your idea <coughs> that Anapanasati was originally not part of the Kayagatasati Sutta fit with what is said about Kayagatasati in the first book of the Anguttara Nikaya? Book 1 of the Anguttara Nikaya in Bhikkhu translation says that practicing Kayagatasati leads to realization of the fruit of knowledge, page 582, and liberation, 589. The underlying tendencies are uprooted, 592, Nibbana through non-clinging, etc. Of all the practices mentioned in the Kaya Gatasati Sutta, Anapanasati, in the complete 16-step version, seems the only one with which this can be accomplished. Is it therefore possible that the first tetrati is here representative for all 16 steps? Yeah, the, the point I was uh, trying to make last time was... Uh, principally coming from the Satipatthana Sutta. And uh, in the case of the Kaya Gatasati Sutta, uh, the evidence is not so clear because we have only two versions. I was saying in the case of the Satipatthana Sutta, where we have three versions, in one version it's clearly not found. This, of course, also has bearing on the Kaya Gatasati Sutta, but there I cannot take such a strong position. And the basic point uh, that strikes me, that, that kind of came out of this um, academic comparative study in its repercussion on the actual practice, is that uh, allowing, uh, in my vision of uh, Kayanopasana, or body contemplation, as the first of the four Satipatthanas, to set mindfulness of breathing apart, I had two... Uh, benefits. And one was that by kind of reducing body contemplation to those exercises, Satipatthana exercises, that are found in all three versions, I got a very distinct vision of what contemplation of the body is actually about. And this is, it is about understanding the nature of the body. The use of the body as a tool to develop mindfulness is a result of that, but the main thrust is understanding the nature of the body through exercise that usually in modern days are rarely practiced, anatomical parts, 
we are going to that soon this like head hair skin etc four elements and the cemetery contemplations and we will be discussing this very soon today, but these are very strong exercises. And this is the common core of the first Satipatthana in the parallel versions. And this has, uh, it has really impacted my own practice and also the way how I teach Satipatthana. And looking at mindfulness of breathing then, it has made me realize even more than earlier the importance of the 16-step scheme. And this is also what Manfred brings in here uh, when he says, does the first tetra not stand representative for all 16 steps? I think in the connection of the actual discourse that we are discussing, not because if it would stand for all 16 steps, we would get all 16 steps. But to me, allowing mindfulness of breathing to not be part of the earliest conception of the first Satipatthana brings mindfulness breathing back to its original place as a full-fledged practice of all four satipatthanas that can on its own lead to realization so it's not it's not uh, simplistically said i'm not i'm it's not diminishing its value but actually actually to me it it, it even enhanced its value and, and i also see how the dynamics of the whole 16 steps do not really unfold if one takes only the first four the question of what is then the issue of Kaya Gata Sati and how could it lead to realization if we assume that uh, uh, an early version of the discourse we are discussing now did not have mindfulness of breathing is precisely what I said before. The powerful effect of coming to know the nature of the body. The body is not beautiful, the body is not self, elements, and the body is going to die. And then this, in connection with the development of samatha, particularly we get even the jhanas here, is a very powerful combination. I see in that combination, I see this very strong potential that we will also be hearing about in this discourse. I'm, I'm aware that this is somewhat uh, controversial. Again, I've already gotten into some controversies. If you look at the forum, I find it difficult to get out of them. But the thing is, the way I was also taught meditation in, in Theravada tradition, it seemed at the beginning, and I exaggerate a little bit now, as if there's only mindfulness of breathing and nothing else. And basically, this is the one way to go. And this certainly reflects the incredible power of this particular meditation practice. And it also reflects somehow the regard that tradition has for the Buddha as the teacher who, according to the sources, practiced mindfulness of breathing as his path towards awakening. It was presumably based on mindfulness of breathing that he developed the absorptions and then the three higher knowledges. But I think it is important to be aware that the suttas offer us a whole variety of different meditation practices. And uh, again, speaking just about myself, I am, um, I found the use of the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, as a structured approach to the development of mental tranquility, for me works much better than mindfulness of breathing. This is not a general value statement, it's just reflecting my own experience and why I think it is uh, good also to be aware of the fact that there is not only mindfulness of breathing. There's another comment by Manfred. Anapanasati postures, full awareness, foulness, elements, charm, ground contemplation, and jhanas are described in Majjhima Nikaya 119, all end with memories and intentions being based on the household life are abandoned. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and concentrated. And he asks, does his mind become steadied internally, quiet, brought to singleness and concentrated, not mean jhana or something equivalent to it? And would that not contradict the idea that it is only at the third tetrad of Anapanasati that jhana comes in? Yeah. The issue about the third tetrad of Anapanasati, I have uh, posted a link on the blog. I have discussed it in a publication, so I don't want to go into that in uh, detail now. 
The expression, his mind becomes steadied, eternally quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. It certainly speaks of deep concentration and quiet, probably, of jhana. The issue about memory, what causes this, is a little difficult in the Pali version. Uh, if we just look at the discourse, uh, I'm starting here with the same phrase in the Chinese version. In this way, dwelling in a secluded spot, with the mind free from indolence, practicing energetically, he removes any defilements from the mind and attains concentration of the mind. Having attained concentration of the mind, he knows the body as described above, as it really is. This is how a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body. In both versions, this description comes also after the jhanas. It's only a little difficult to see how somebody having attained the jhana still needs to remove defilements from the mind, but that is still somehow one can think this is probably talking about subtle defilements and attains concentration, maybe he or she is deepening concentration. But in Majjhimani Kaya 119, this is really difficult because somebody who has gotten into a jhana and then only comes to the point of memories and intentions being based on the household life are abundant, with their abandoning his mind becomes steadied internally, etc. This doesn't work. And I think there is some problem there in the transmission of the Pali version. Memories and intentions based on the household life need to be abundant before jhana attainment. And this abandoning and steadening of the mind internally will then lead into jhana attainment, not the other way around. I'm waiting for Martin if you have something to question because otherwise I continue to the next topic. Are the full translation of the Madhyama Agama Sutras available to us? No, I mean the this the, the excerpts that I'm giving to you here are part of a translation project in which I'm involved. And the Madhyama Agama uh, will be published when we have finished that translation project. And so this is uh, depending a little bit on the time. But my comment now, Martin, was based on the Pali version. So there it's just a question, if, if you don't read Pali, to take Biko Bodhi's translation. And just, just look it up. It's really the reliable translation by Biko Bodhi and it's the best one to use if one wants to look up some things. And so there's this, 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 this refrain which, this passage which, um, uh, Manfred has just quoted. And then you find that, well, he abbreviates it, but it, it comes also after the jhanas. And so you, you see that this, this internal, lack of coherence is there in the Pali version and we don't in this case we don't the, the the Chinese version only confirms to us that this is something specific to the Pali version but the the problem I mentioned just now is it is possible to recognize that with the Pali version alone it is not so clear because when the body abbreviates and he always abbreviates to make the text shorter but if you if you look at it's page 953 this is where he gives the translation of the jhanas and then you just read the jhana part and then you always read the part that 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 he has abbreviated as he abides thus diligent, arduous, and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abundant. With the abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, etc. If you just read this together, you will see the point that I'm making. And I mean, this is uh, th this could just be an some kind of an accident during oral transmission that this this passage was not meant to be after all, and then it came to be added to all uh, expositions here in Majjhimaika 119. John Emmer, you said just now that memories of the household life need to be abandoned before reaching jhanas. What about Chitta and Samyutanika is described as a household and yet who describes himself attaining all four jhanas? Yeah, the issue is not about being a householder, John. Uh, the issue is that this is talking about um, when you when 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 I sit down to meditate, and instead of concentrating, I keep thinking, ah, 
You know, before I was a monk, I could eat what I like, I could have ice cream in the evening, and now I only get this begged food, and I had all these beautiful girls to talk to, and you know, this, this is kind of intentions and memories based on the household life. It does not mean... Uh, the, the, these are, in this discourse, uh, intentions and memories that a monk has, but it does not necessarily mean that the householder must have such thoughts. This is another topic that I am going to get into, which you already asked on the forum also, this um, strong division between laity and monk. Yeah... Maybe I take this first. I hope I don't forget to take the other one by Jeff then. It's on that topic. Uh, John again. Okay, we are talking about it in practice, not necessarily the wider lifestyle of the meditator. Well, the, yes and no. I mean, I'm, uh, there is no principal difference between you not wearing this beautiful colored robe and me wearing this colored robe. How ever the lifestyle that I'm supposed to be following wearing this uh, dress is supposed to be more conducive to to, 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 to the practice. This is why uh, the Buddha uh, uh, presumably invented it. So the issue in meditating is not whether you're a lay person or a monk in dress, but uh, what degree of renunciation you have in your mind. And if I am a, a monk who is extremely busy and even say I don't engage in any kind of wrong conduct but I have a big monastery and I have a branch monastery and now there's not enough uh, money for the branch monastery and I have to go out and collect money and there's some uh, discussion between the other monks at, the, at my main monastery and I have to settle it and I have to clarify and do and I will be so busy with all these thoughts that it will be difficult for me to meditate and if you, John are living, I, I mean, I don't know what lifestyle you live, but if you live a relatively quiet and simple lifestyle, you might be in a better situation to get deep concentration than me. Dania, that's a good point, Bhante. If you can elaborate on it when you have a chance, late in monastic, it's a bit depressing when the Buddha mostly refers to a bhikkhu when he talks about practice. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the point I... I'm going to get to now. It's good that you mention it, Dania. So let me let me put in this. Um, this is a remark by Jeff Hardin. <coughs> in the Kaya Sati Sutta, we see the inside refrain of the Satipatthana Sutta replaced with a tranquility refrain. Do you believe that there is any relationship between these two approaches and the intended audience of the suttas? For example, it seems that the Satipatthana Sutta was addressed to a mixed audience that contained many lay practitioners, the Kurus who may not have had the time or the conditions of seclusion required to develop deep samadhi. On the other hand, the Kaya Gatasati Sutta seems to have been addressed to an audience of monastics who were encouraged to seek seclusion and practice diligently. Is there any correlation between suttas that propose one approach over the other, insight versus tranquility, and their intended audience, lay versus monastic? Or is the setting of the suttas the least reliable and most subject to transmission errors, and therefore one cannot make such conclusions? Yeah, first of all, the narrative introduction to a discourse is less reliable in the transmission compared to its contents. And Gregory Chopin, one of our, uh, an outstanding scholar from the U.S., has found an instruction in the Mula Savastivada and Maha Sangika Vinaya, according to which a monk who has forgotten where a particular discourse was believed to have taken place can just invent it. In, this, is, this is a real ruling. So if you, if I, if I'm reciting this discourse on mindfulness of the body, and I forgot where it happened, then just say it happened in Savati. You will never be wrong. There's a lot of things that happened at Anatta Pindika's place in Savati. So I think to draw conclusions based on the narrative setting is fraught with difficulties. And in my comparative studies. I found in general more differences between parallel versions regarding the narrative setting than the actual content. And the other thing is, 
the issue of instructions for laity and for monastics, and this is also what Dania was asking about now, and I already mentioned that a little bit to John Emmer on the blog, but I think it's good if I if I expand on that once more. Um, there's a there's a certain formal-like way of of talking. Uh, and that is that when they use bhikkhu, if I would address all of you, I would also say bhikkhus, because one bhikkhu is there. Doesn't mean that I'm only talking to that one bhikkhu, but this is the way how in the ancient times they would talk. So uh, instruction addressed to bhikkhus doesn't mean this is not for bhikkhunis, not for samaneris, not for samaneras, not for lay people, male or female. It's just meant that in the audience, the foremost group, according to ancient Indian hierarchy, were bhikkhus. That's all. And I do not see that a strong type of a division between this is for lay people and this is for monastics. I, I, I think it's more the question of this is for somebody who wants to practice seriously and this is for somebody who does not want to practice seriously. And let us not forget that many monastics in ancient days and modern days are not necessarily taking the robes because they want to do intensive practice. There's a number of very good and valuable reasons why somebody might want to become a monk or a nun. But it need not be just for meditation. And let us also remember that, as we heard of Chitta, is a very good example. And also in modern days, I know a number of lay practitioners who have really made incredible progress in the practice. So it's not it's not a, a question in principle as such. And I don't think there are... Let me put it this way. I'm not aware of... I, I would not be able to draw a clear line between this... This is the meditation for lay people, and this, this is the meditation for monastics. But I am able to draw a clear line between this is the type of meditation for somebody who does not want to practice seriously, and this is the type of meditation for somebody who wants to practice seriously. And I think this is the real distinction that we should that we should keep in mind. Yeah, I think we had that also with the Anuruddha Suttas. This, this type of address that he says Anuruddhas, even though the Buddha would have known only one of the three monks is called Anuruddha and the other two have a different name. And then the issue of insight versus tranquility, which Jeff mentioned, if we come back to our overall topic, I think we found in that beautiful exposition that Bhikkhu Bodhi has got us started off when this course started, that there is no fixed rule, no? If, if I remember right. There was no rule saying you have to do first this and then that. There's a way of doing insight first, there's a way of tranquility first, there's a way of combining both. So I don't think there's such a ruling in general and there's also not a specific ruling for lay people or monastics, males or females, uh, Asians or Westerners, whatever. It's just a question of one's own personality and inclinations what one finds helpful and useful to cultivate, and as one keeps cultivating, one tries to aim at balance. And that quality where one is strong, one slowly tries to bring in the other quality. It's something quite individual, I think. Lovely to get some discussion. <clears throat> This is, again, Jeff Hardin. <coughs> you commented that in the Madhyama Agama, the Kaya Sati Sutta is earlier than the Satipatthana Sutta. I wasn't sure if you meant that the Kaya Sati Sutta represents an earlier stratum of Buddhism, or were just referring to the numerical order of the suttas in the MA collection. Is there a correlation with position in Agama and the age of the discourse? Yeah, I don't think there is a necessary correlation with the position although we often find that um, groupings that seem to be later additions will be usually at the beginning or the end. But I was just referring to earliness in the sense of being earlier when one recites the whole collection. Madhyama Agama is a, a very long collection, over 200 discourses. It, you can't recite it in one day, so it's divided into recitation sections. And one has to do uh, one section per day, and it takes, I think, a week or so to get through reciting the Madhyama Agama. 
and this is one of the problems of, of oil transmission. When I was studying this whole issue of oil transmission, I, I, I thought I also have to try out myself how this works, and so I memorized, I memorized Dhammapada, Satipatthana Sutta, and the Patimokka, the Code of Rules for Monks. And I found that already memorizing for somebody like me in the modern day society, bad memory, is quite challenging, but the real problem actually is maintaining it. You see, the issue is not just memorizing something, but once you have memorized it, you have to keep on and on and on reciting it, otherwise you start forgetting it. And this is where I failed. I have not been able to keep up that regular recitation practice, and so I no longer am able to memorize, uh, say from memory, recite from memory, the Dhammapada or the Satipatthana Sutta or the Padimokha. But interestingly, when I sometimes get bits and pieces, I get exactly the type of errors that I found in my comparative study. Either I am putting something out of sequence, or like I, I just had it last weekend, I had a Dhammapada verse, the first half one verse, and the second half for another verse. And somehow, even though they were clearly distinct in the original, in my memory, I had connected them together. I had created a new Dhammapada verse. And this is exactly what we find also in, in, in his comparative study, this kind of misplacing from here to there, connecting things that were originally not connecting, losing some other parts. Yeah, so this is about the questions from the forum. And um, if there are no other questions, then we go and continue with our discourse. <clears throat> so the first paragraph I already read, and this is the one we should keep in mind. It comes after each of the exercises. Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk completely drenches and pervades his body with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion experienced in the first absorption, so that there is no part within his body that is not pervaded by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. It is just as the bath attendant, having filled a vessel with bathing powder, might mix it with water and knead it, so that there is no part of the powder that is not completely drenched and pervaded with water. Yeah, we have one... Uh, substantial differences between this and the uh, Majjhima Nikaya 119, in that Majjhima Nikaya 119, the Pali version, also describes the actual attainment of the jhana. And uh, <clears throat> since we are here in the context of contemplation of the body, uh, I find the Madhyama Agma version more natural, because it is really only describing the effect of the jhana on the body the completely drenching and pervading the body with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And if this should be the original version, it would be very easy uh, for uh, the fact that the description of jhana is kind of missing to lead to it being brought in during oral transmission, even almost automatically, because everywhere else the description of this physical experience of the jhana is accompanied or is preceded by a description of the actual jhana attainment. So the point at stake here seems to be that experiencing the happiness of jhana with the body is an aspect of body contemplation. And I think this is really remarkable if we think of the way the body is seen in uh, many spiritual traditions, and we will also come to an exercise very soon that expresses a very negative evaluation of the beauty of the physical body. Here we get an exercise that consciously encourages filling the whole body with thrill and bliss. The issue of whether one can experience the jhana actually with the body or not is a controversial issue in modern-day meditation circles, and I have already briefly uh, mentioned my personal take on that. My personal understanding is that a jhana experience is a state of uh, mental unification, and so mind and body to some degree become one, and then it is somewhat a question of the 
perspective one takes on this experience, when one looks at it from the mental side, it's just mind. And when one looks at it from the body, it's just the whole body filled with bliss. Thus my personal feeling would be that those who describe it one way or the other are simply talking about two sides of the same coin. But the fact that uh, jhana experiences are listed under body contemplations in the two versions of the Kāyagata Sati Sutta clearly gives canonical support to the interpretation that the body is filled with bliss and happiness when one experiences jhana. And this is, I would understand, to be of such type that one does not experience normal bodily sensations. And we get also a simile for that. And for understanding this uh, simile, I think we might want to keep in mind that in ancient India they didn't have bathrooms like we have today, but they would usually go to the river to bathe. And there are separate places, one for women, one for men. <clears throat> and when you go to the river to bathe and you have some sort of powder, uh, it is difficult to bathe with it because it might get scattered by the wind or you can't really hold it. So what you want to do is you want to first have some way of, of making it ready for use. And this is this idea of kneading it with water. And so the idea we get here is something as thoroughly pervaded. It's just that the, the, the powder and the water are so become one that, that, that there is no part of the part that is not completely moisturized. In the same way, this experience of the first uh, jhana described here is such that the whole body is moisturized with this happiness, this bliss, this rapture, this pleasure. And it, it's, it's a totality experience. Then comes the second jhana. <coughs> Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk completely drenches and pervades his body with rapture and pleasure born of concentration experienced in the second absorption, so that there is no part within his body that is not pervaded by rapture and pleasure born of concentration. This is a deeper level of uh, joy and happiness, rapture and pleasure, because it's samadhi jha. It's not only born of seclusion from sensuality, but born of concentration proper, very deep concentration reached with the second absorption. And we get a simile again. It is just like a mountain spring that is full and overflowing with clear, clean water, so that water coming from any of the four directions cannot enter it, with the spring water welling up from the bottom on its own, flowing out and flooding the surroundings, completely drenching, pervading every part of the mountain. Yeah, we see that here the imagery is progressing on this this water uh, image. First, we just have the water is sufficient to mix the powder, but now it's just is flowing, overflowing, gushing out, clear, clean water, and everything is just flooded by the water. This is the experience of rapture, piety, that is pervading the whole body. These waves of rapture, the whole body is pervaded. Everything is flooded with this incredible joy and happiness, this, this intense rapture that has basically no comparison to anything else in the world. And recommendable. This is the pleasure that, uh, according to early Buddhism, is recommendable, that should be cultivated, that should be made much of. Nothing problematic about it. And next comes the third jhana. Again, the monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk, or a nun, or a lay person, or a female lay follower, completely drenches and pervades his or her body with pleasure born of the absence of rapture experienced in the third absorption, so that there is no part within of this body that is not pervaded by pleasure born of the absence of rapture. It is just this blue, red, or white lotus that is born in the water and has come to full growth in the water, remains submerged in water with every part of its roots, stem, flower and leaves completely drenched and pervaded by water with no part that is not pervaded by it. Here yeah, there's a there's a refinement. Piti has gone into abeyance and there's just sukha, happiness or pleasure. And the imagery we get you see there's no longer any motion. It's just this flower, the beauty of the mind, this beautiful flower 
and it's it's completely immersed in water, but the water is no longer moving. Everything is just drenched and pervaded by water, completely immersed in this profound and sublime happiness. And the fourth. Again, the monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. <clears throat> a monk mentally resolves <clears throat> to dwell, having accomplished a complete pervasion of his body with mental purity experienced in the fourth absorption. So there is no part within his body that is not pervaded by mental purity. It's just as a man might cover himself from head to foot with a cloth measuring seven or eight cubits, so that every part of his body is covered. In the Pali version we are told this cloth is of white color. The imagery now we get is this aloofness and this complete imperturbability. We discussed that before. Com complete separation from the outside. And this profound degree of equanimity when even happiness has gone into abeyance. So this is contemplation of the body and here we get the whole <coughs> range of the four jhanas has a way of contemplating the body. I find this very remarkable. Now come two exercises which I personally think are later edition in the Madhyama Agama version. They are not found in the Pali. Again, the monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk is mindful of the perception of light. Aloka Sanya. I'm just giving the Pali for you to know what this is about. Properly taking hold of it, properly retaining it, and recollecting it properly with mindfulness. So that what is behind is like what is in front, what is in front is like what is behind. Night is like day, day is like night. What is above is like what is below, and what is below is like what is above. In this way he develops an undistorted and undefiled state of mind that is bright and clear. A state of mind that is totally unobscured by impediments. <coughs> Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk properly grasps the reviewing sign, the Pachavekkana Nimitta, recollecting it properly with mindfulness. It is just as a person who is seated might contemplate another person who is lying down, or one who is lying down might contemplate another person who is seated. Yes, so these two exercises are not found in the Pali version. And it is also not quite clear what the uh, perception of light or the reviewing sign would have to do with the body. We are talking about contemplation of the body here. And so an explanation <coughs> could be there are other discourses. We have one discourse in the Anguttara Nikaya, 629, volume 3, 323, where we find that uh, there are five recollections. And one of these is the perception of light, and then there come the three absorptions, and then come the contemplation of the anatomical parts and of the body, of the cemetery contemplations. So because we also get the absorptions here in this discourse, and also we will soon come to the anatomical parts and the corpse in decay, it is quite possible that a reciter <coughs> who knew that this reviewing, uh, excuse me, well, perception of light, is in this one discourse connected to these exercises could easily lead to a drawing of this exercise into another context. This is what I was just telling you, what happened to me when I sometimes try to remember the Dhammapada, that something from another context is, gets just drawn over into it. And we get the similar thing for the reviewing sign. <coughs> this is the Anguttara Nikaya discourse. There is uh, holding in mind the reviewing sign and then the four absorptions followed by these similes that describe the physical effect of the absorptions. Again, this could have led to a drawing of this exercise into the present context. A weakness of this hypothesis, which to which I am indebted to Tsefu Kwan to some extent, is that we do not have uh, parallels in the Sarvastiva tradition for these two discourses. These two discourses are from the Pali from the Theravada canon. But as I said before, the Anguttara Nikaya, we don't have a Savastivada or a Mula Savastivada complete collection of this. So it is quite possible, but we can never be sure that such discourses also existed in the Savastivada or 
Mula Savastivara tradition. Such an er error would explain how come that exercises that have no evident relation to contemplation of the body have become part of contemplation of the body in the Savastivada tradition. And this is the case for the Kayagata Sati Sutta, the parallel to Majjhimanikaya 119, and also for the parallel to the Satipatthana Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 10. In both cases, we find that the, the perception of light and the reviewing sign are part of contemplation of the body, where they are, even though they are clearly misfits. Now we come to the <clears throat> recollection of impurity. When I teach Satipatthana at the university or as meditation, this is always the most challenging for people, especially in the West. Not so much in Asia, though. Okay, let's have a look at this and, and see if uh, we can get through it. <clears throat> Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk contemplates this body from head to foot <coughs> according to its position and according to its attractive and repulsive qualities as full of various kinds of impurities, reflecting within this body of mind there are head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, rough and smooth epidermis, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, heart, kidneys, liver, lungs, large intestine, small intestine, spleen, a stomach, feces, brain and brain stem, tears, sweat, mucus, saliva, pus, blood, fat, marrow, phlegm, bile, urine. It is just as a person endowed with eyesight, on seeing a container full of various seeds, might clearly distinguish them all identifying them as rice seeds, millet seeds, barley, wheat, hemp seeds, sesame seeds, beans, turnip seeds, and mustard seeds. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> what my students usually find particularly challenging is this idea of impurity. And uh, the rendering of the Chinese, the origin is Bujing, uh, is to some extent open to question. Uh, the rendering is based on the Pali version. It has asuchi, which means impure. But uh, in principle, the Chinese term could also render asubha, which means not beautiful. And we have a Pali discourse, the Girimananda Sutta, where this exercise is described using both terms interchangingly. It's introduced as asubhasanya, perception of not beauty, absence of beauty, but then the actual description uses asuchi. And I think we have to understand that in the ancient Indian context, to call the human body impure was a very natural thing as part of the way of thinking at that time, whereas nowadays this seems to be an unwarranted value judgment. Therefore, when actually teaching this kind of meditation, I prefer to use the other term, not beautiful. Ah, subha. Subha means beauty, and ah means there is no beauty. It's bereft of beauty. It's not attractive. Or my friend Gil Fronstal says, it's not appetizing. <laughs> I like that. Not appetizing. The point of this exercise is not to inculcate negativity towards the body. In fact, there's a rather dramatic story in the Vinaya of some monks who commit suicide because the Buddha had just recommended uh, contemplating the impure nature of the body without giving full instructions, and they kind of set off on their own, and they did it in such a way that they got disgusted by their own body, and then they either killed themselves or else got somebody to kill them. And this is clearly not the point of the practice. It's not meant to lead to negativity to the body, towards the body. In fact, in the Chinese version, we get this very nice thing. Yeah, you can see according to its position and according to its attractive and repulsive qualities. And this is an important pointer 
and even though we don't get this attractive and repulsive qualities in the Pali, we have issues like head hair and body hair, nails and teeth and our versions, and normally these are not experienced as repulsive. Head hair, especially, and beautiful nails, beautiful teeth, this, these are usually seen as things that are attractive. Um, contrary to saliva, pus and blood, which are usually seen as unattractive or repulsive. But the overall aim of this type of exercise is to deconstruct the notion of bodily beauty in order to lead to concentration, in order to discover what is mental beauty, the concentrated mind. Thus the issue is not to lead to a world where there is no more beauty at all, but much rather to replace a conception of beauty that is based on modern fashion design and ideas that one has or either not has and that has to be enhanced by external kinds of um, tools and pasting oneself here and there, makeup and stuff, through something that everybody can develop within. And that is the beauty of the calm mind, the beauty of the mind that experiences those deep stages of concentration which we just the saw described so beautifully in these similes. And as a detergent, a detergent that uh, takes out infatuation with bodily beauty from the mind in order to make the space for mental beauty to happen, such an exercise has its place. But it should be clearly understood also that the simile conveys a sense of neutrality. This container in the Pali, it's Ubatu Mukamotoli, a double-mouthed bag, which according to Professor Schlingloff refers to as some sewing utensil that was used where one puts in the grains and then there's a small outlet for the grains that one lets them out while one is walking down the field that is being plowed. Looking at various grains, what we have here, rice and barley and wheat, there's nothing about these grains that makes them attractive, but there's also nothing that makes them repulsive or impure. So the point is that from seeing some parts of the body like head hair and body hair as beautiful and others mucus, saliva and pus as ugly or repulsive, one eventually comes to see them all as simply parts of the body. They have their function, good that they are there, but no need to get excited with them in one way or in another way. Nobody shouting at me? No? <laughs> Usually when I have a real class, then there's like... <laughs> That's maybe the advantage of the virtual class. I will get all the re replies only in the forum during the next week. So we continue with the next exercise. <clears throat> Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk contemplates the body as made up of elements. Within this body of mind, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, it should be actually the wind element, I'm sorry, the space element and the consciousness element. It is just as a bachon, having slaughtered and skinned a cow, might divide it into six parts and spread them on the ground. Yeah, the, we have the same exercise in the Satipatthana Sutta, and there the Ekotarika Agama version, the third parallel, also has only four elements. It seems clear that the Madhyama Agama version here has expanded to the four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind. The space element could still be seen as in some way related to the body, but the conscious element is a clear misfit. And in this case, the simile has been adjusted. In the other version, the butcher cuts up a cow into four parts. Here it is divided into six parts. The point of this exercise is anatta, is about not-self. It is a form of contemplation where one realizes that uh, this my body is simply a product of four basic qualities, hardness, wetness, temperature and motion, which are found in my body just as much as outside, anywhere in nature or even in this computer here in front of me. 
and there's no intrinsic difference between these. And this exercise can become a very strong antidote to any kind of conceit, eye-making, my-making in relation to the body. And it's interesting that here we get this rather uh, cruel simile of a butcher who kills a cow. It's really striking, strikingly strong, especially if we compare it with the earlier simile where we had just this very peaceful uh, looking at various seeds. And this is just my personal interpretation, but I think I take it that uh, while the other exercise is in itself rather challenging, we get a peaceful simile to to kind of balance it out and show it's all about being neutral. And this exercise on the elements, the simile gives a little sharpening to it. Uh, the point of doing this element contemplation is really to cut up, to slaughter one's sense of selfhood in relation to the body, to really divide it into parts, spread them out on the ground. <clears throat> the purpose of the idea behind the simile is that once the butcher has cut up the cow and is about to sell it, he will no longer think of it in terms of cow, but he will think of it in terms of uh, meat, uh, uh, steak or whatever. No longer think of it in terms of cow. And so similarly the meditator who cuts up his or her body into the element no longer thinks of it as one compact unit that is mine, but simply as a combination of these qualities, of these four qualities. Now we get the cemetery contemplations. <clears throat> Again, a monk cultivates mindfulness of the body as follows. A monk contemplates a corpse dead for one or two or up to six or seven days that is being pecked at by crows, devoured by jackals and wolves, burned by fire or buried in the earth, and is completely rotten and decomposed. Seeing this, he compares himself to it. The present body of mine is also like this. It is of the same nature and yet cannot escape this fate. This comparison is the main point of the exercise. We have some variations in with the Pali version. doesn't mention burned by fire or bird in the earth. But the real important aspect is this, this, this reflection. My own body is also mortal. And it will also fall apart. And then the Sutta gives us various stages how this can fall apart. So just as he has formerly seen in the charnel ground, so monk recollects a carcass of bluish color, decomposed and half eaten by animals, with the bones lying on the ground still connected together. And he compares himself to it. And just as he has formerly seen in a charnel ground, so monk recollects a skeleton without skin, flesh or blood, held together only by sinews, and seeing it, he compares himself to it. Just as he has formerly seen in a charnel ground, so a monk recollects disconnected bones scattered in all directions, foot bones, shin bones, thigh bones, hip bone, vertebrae, shoulder bones, neck bones, a skull, all in different places, and seeing this, he compares himself to it. Just as he has formerly seen in a charnel ground, so a monk recollects bones white like shells, or bluish like the color of a pigeon, or red as if smeared with blood, rotting and decomposing, crumbling to death. Seeing it, he compares himself to it. Obviously the practical question is how to do it. Not so many places where one can nowadays go and see a body uh, falling apart. Some uh, do this with the help of pictures. Sometimes on the internet one can find or through friends like among monks, we have a circle, we share a certain kind of a set of pictures that show a human body decomposing. What I usually suggest my students is that the main gist of this exercise is to simply be aware of death. And so uh, a practical way of undertaking recommended elsewhere in the discourses is to simply also use mindfulness of breathing, to be aware of the simple fact that the next breath is not sure to take place. Or one can use a, a reflection whenever somebody else dies. One knows that 
in one's environment somebody will have died some relative some 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 friends always keep coming back to the fact that the same is going to happen to ourselves this is i said before that the anatomical parts is usually the kind of exercise where i get the strongest reactions from my students but i think this is probably the most challenging one actually there's a fascinating research done in psychology um, on what they call terror management theory. Terror management theory. The theory of what we do to manage existential terror. The thing is that uh, similar to animals, we have a survival instinct. But unlike animals, we know that in the final count, this survival instinct will not be successful. We know that at some point we are going to die, whatever we do. And this tension between the wish to survive and the awareness of our mortality creates existential terror. And this terror wants to be managed. And if you read this, there's, there's over 200 papers on this. If you read on this terror management theory, you find a huge amount of behaviors in society are meant to help us to get away from this awareness of our own mortality. They do all kinds of things. They test, they call it mortality salience. Say they, they, they one exercise I found very striking was about, uh, they, they were giving the story of a prostitute and the, uh, the 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 people who were being measured were asked whether she should be given strong punishment or weak punishment for whatever she had done and the difference between the two groups was that one of the groups was uh, they were just let past the mortuary or something just just for a moment be made aware of their own mortality and this moment of mortality salience being made aware of their own mortality made them become more wanting to defend what they consider as their social identity and thus react much more strongly, recommend stronger punishment. Or be then they had another exercise uh, and another research with Jews. How do people more negatively evaluate Christians, more negatively evaluate Jews once they have been made aware of their own mortality? A whole range, I mean, this has nothing to do with prostitutes and Jews as such. It's just there's a whole range of defensive mechanisms that are that there's there's a defensive mechanism against mortality built up in the way how we build up our own identity as myself being a Buddhist monk, part of Germany, part of something wider that survives me. And if I'm being made aware of my own mortality, there's an immediate reaction that I'm going to defend that social identity much more stronger. It's an absolutely fascinating area of research and I recommend all of you who are interested in this to 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 read into that research, terror management theory. And I think the point of this present exercise, what it's really asking is simply to directly face the fact that all of you there and me here, we are definitely going to die. There's no question about it. Could even happen right now. It's a very powerful contemplation. Very, very powerful. Martin Seinsticker, still, are you willing to share the images you have of decomposing bodies? I have to look up, Martin. I'm not sure I have them anymore because I'm not using them. I'm using the breath only. I, I find that um, the images were good for me to see them one time, but to, 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 to get further involved with them. But I, ca I can look it up if I have them somewhere. It was a whole whole bunch of them. I'll, I'll look it up and let you know. <laughs> Robert Grosh, this reaction you describe is also fascinating because it is absurd. We will all die, so we all sit in the same boat. Yeah, Robert, but uh, the the thing is, this is not so much on the rational level, no. It is. Uh, it is not that these people consciously think uh, in that way. It is an, an a very at the very gut level a a a, a defense reaction that that happens. And it just tells us about the difficulty. And I mean, if you if you try it after the class is over and you sit there and you're just really aware 
the next breath the next breath could be the last and you do that for half an hour you will understand what i'm talking about it's something that nobody finds easy to to accept and when i teach this i always recommend to relax on the out breath because otherwise it become agitating that in breath be aware this might be the last out breath relax and let go so it becomes something very smooth and then and, and it becomes more peaceful it's a very challenging kind of practice but it has an incredible amount of power to make one live one last life meaningful and in the actual meditation context, it really brings one back into the present moment. Somebody who is aware that he or she might die the next moment will be very less inclined to dabble in this and that while meditating or to dabble in this and that while in outside life. Be very focused. And it is because of this potential, and this is my reply to Manfred Wiesberger, I think what we have seen now, these jhanas, this, this beauty and happiness of the mind pervading the whole body, then this deconstruction of bodily beauty, this taking away the sense of I from the body, and finally this finishing touch by awareness of death, this is an extremely powerful medicine. It's really transformative, I believe. And I see in this, I see the real potential of Kaya Gatasati, as Manfred mentioned, uh, so much uh, emphasized in the Anguttara Nikaya. And we, this is what we, what, what we get in the discourse. If mindfulness of the body is cultivated like this, made much of like this, then all wholesome states are comprised in it, that is, the states that pertain to awakening. Whatever state of mind he resolves, one reaches completion. It is compared to the great ocean, since all small rivers are ultimately contained in the ocean. If there are renunciants and Brahmins who have not properly established mindfulness of the body, who dwell with a narrow mind, then Mara, the evil one, on seeking an opportunity with them, will certainly get it. Why? Because those renunciants and Brahmins are devoid of mindfulness of the body. It is just as if there were an empty water pot standing firmly upright on the ground, and someone were to bring water and pour it into the pot. What do you think, monks, under these circumstances? Would that pot accommodate the water? Blessed one, it would accommodate it. If there are renunciants and Brahmins who have properly established mindfulness of the body, who dwell with a boundless mind, then Mara, the evil one, on seeking an opportunity with them, will in the end not get it. Why? because those renunciants and Brahmins are not devoid of mindfulness of the body. It is just as if there were a water pot full of water, standing firmly upright on the ground, and someone were to bring water and pour it into the pot. What do you think, monks, under these circumstances? Would that pot accommodate the extra water? The monks replied, Blessed one, it would not. So we get this, uh, Mara is a personification of either one's own defilements or challenges posed to one from the outside and we get this imagery of the power of mindfulness of the body in dealing with such mara or we, we would say in modern days with either defilements or problems that come to us from the outside with this beautiful imagery of the water pot that takes more water, or when it's full, it won't take any more water. And there's uh, more of these similes to come. If there are renunciants and Brahmins who have not properly established mindfulness of the body, who dwell with a narrow mind, then Mara, the evil one, and seek an opportunity with them, will certainly get it. Why? Because those renunciants and Brahmins are devoid of mindfulness of the body. It is just as if a strong man were to throw a big heavy stone at a mass of wet mud. What do you think, monks? Would the mud be penetrated by that stone? And the monks say it would be penetrated. And then we get the contrary. If there are renunciants and brahmins who have properly established mindfulness of the body, who dwell with a boundless mind, <coughs> then Mara, the evil one, on seeking an opportunity with them, will in the end not get it. Why? Because those renunciants and Brahmins are not devoid of mindfulness of the body. It is just as if a strong man were to throw a light ball made of hair at a straight door. What do you think, monks? Would the door be penetrated by it? 
the monks replied, it would not be penetrated by it. So here we get this imagery of mindfulness of the body being like 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 a protection where things that come at us just bounce off instead of penetrating and getting inside. And there is still another simile, again the narrow mind, etc. I only read the simile. It is just as if someone who was in need of fire were to use dry wood, used as a base, and drill it with a dry drill. What do you think, monks? Would that person get fire in this way? And the monks say, he would get it. And then the opposite, mindfulness of the body is well established, just a simile. It is just as if someone needing fire were to use moist wood as a base and to drill it with a moist drill. What do you think, monks? Would that person get fire in this way? And the monks say he would not get it. So here we get this imagery of fire that uh, when mindfulness of the body is properly properly practiced, the, it is, will not be so easy for us to get inflamed, to go off into fire. And um, I have uh, summarized here the similes for you. Yeah, there they are all. So there's first this <clears throat> general simile of the comprehensiveness of mindfulness of the body, similar to the ocean that comprises all the rivers. And then we have this pouring water into the jug, throwing a ball at mud or a panel, and then making fire with dry and wet wood. And the interesting thing is we get the uh, <coughs> same similes and a few more similes in the party version, but in a different sequence. And this is again the type of uh, problem that I experience myself with my memorization, that one memorizes, when one has memorized and it's not a hundred percent clear in the mind. One still remembers the pieces, but one has them in a different sequence. So in the Chinese version, if we leave aside the ocean, we get the two jug similes, the two throwing similes, and the two fire making similes. In the Pali version, we get all the negative ones, and then we get all the positive ones. Both sequences make 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 complete sense there's no reason why we should prefer one over the other at least i don't see any reason why we should prefer one over the others and the pali simile has three more the pali version i'm sorry has three more similes it speaks of ability to there's a full jug and to just tip it over there's a pond that is full and one loosens the embankment so the water comes out and there's a chariot that it careful uh, uh, skilled chariot driver is able to drive wherever he wants and these similes are not found in the Chinese after these beautiful similes of the potential of mindfulness of the body we also get a list of the actual benefits that can be expected from somebody who is willing to engage in this kind of practice. Monk or lay people, female, male, no difference. Cultivating mindfulness of the body like this, making much of it like this, should be understood to bring 18 benefits. What are the 18? One is able to be a hunger and thirst, cold and heat, mosquitoes, gadflies, flies, fleas, being assailed by wind and sun, being verbally abused <coughs> and being beaten with sticks, he is able to endure it all. Even if the body suffers disease causing such extreme pain that his life is coming to its end, whatever is unpleasant, he is able to endure it all. This is reckoned the first benefit of cultivating mindfulness of the body like this, making much of it like this. Again, a monk is able to tolerate discontent, if discontent arises, his mind does not become stuck in it. This is reckoned the second benefit. Again, the monk is able to tolerate fear. If fear arises, his mind does not become stuck in it. This is the third benefit. Again, in a monk, the three kinds of unwholesome thoughts may arise. Thoughts of desire, thoughts of anger, and thoughts of harming. If these three kinds of unwholesome thoughts arise, his mind does not become stuck in them. This is reckoned the fourth benefit. 
again separated from desire, separate from evil and unwholesome states, up to a monk dwells having attained the fourth absorption. This is reckoned the fifth up to the eighth benefit. Again, a monk through the elimination of three fetters attains stream entry. He will not fall into evil conditions and is assured of progress towards right awakening within at most seven existences. Having gone through at most seven existences in the heavens or among human beings, he will attain the ending of Dukkha. This is reckoned the ninth benefit. Again, a monk who has eliminated the three fetters reduces sensual desire, anger and ignorance and attains one's returning. Having passed through one existence in a heavenly or human realm, he will attain the ending of Dukkha. <coughs> this is reckoned the tenth benefit. Again, a monk who has eliminated the five lower fetters will be reborn in another realm and there attain final nirvana, having attained the condition of non-returning, not coming back to this world. This is reckoned the eleventh benefit. Again, a monk attains the peaceful liberations that are separated from form. <coughs> Having attained the formless, he dwells, having died, we realize such concentrated states. This is the twelfth benefit. Again, a monk acquires the psychic powers, the divine ear, the knowledge of other minds, the knowledge of former lives, and the knowledge of the birth and death of beings. These are the thirteenth to seventeenth benefits. Again, a monk, by employing wisdom and insight, understands the taints and eradicates them. Through having eradicated all the taints, he attains the taintless liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom, knowing and realizing it by himself here and now, and he dwells having accomplished self-realization. Knowing as it really is, birth is ended, the holy life has been established, what was to be done has been done, there is no more of existence. This is reckoned the eighteenth benefit of cultivating mindfulness of the body like this, making much of it like this. <coughs> Cultivating mindfulness of the body like this, making much of it like this, should be understood to bring these 18 benefits. This is what the Buddha said. Having heard the Buddha's words, the monks were delighted and remembered them well. So you see, today you get the taints, last time you get the influxes, each time it's the same. We're talking about the asavas. <coughs> the <coughs> survey of the benefits in the Madhyama Agama is as follows just in brief. And if we look at the Pali version, we find that uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are not mentioned in the Pali version. Basically from 9 to 12. <coughs> yeah, the attainment of stream entry, once return, non-return, and the immaterial attainments are not mentioned. And number four is also not mentioned. Not be overwhelmed by unwholesome thoughts. But then the three levels of attainment, stream entry, once return, non return, are implicit in the fact that at the end we get the destruction of the influxes. And again, the immaterial attainments are often implicit in the fact that there is a reference to the fourth jhana. So these differences are difference in form, which at least I would not take to imply major difference in content. And so what we get here spread out in front of us is basically um, for a monk or a nun, anything you could wish. You want to be able to deal with the vicissitudes of life as a recluse in ancient India, cold, heat, hunger, thirst, here you go. You want to be make sure you stay in robes and don't become discontented. That is it. No way how to deal with fear. Here you go. Interested in jhanas or maybe even the supernormal powers that can be developed based on them. This is the practice you want to do. No, rather destruction of the influxes. Please. Mindfulness of the body is presented here as a wish-fulfilling gem. Anything that uh, one could think of as attractive from a spiritual perspective this discourse tells us can be gained through mindfulness of breathing. And my personal understanding, <clears throat> based on the comparison also with the Satipatthana Sutta, is really this, uh, this, this, this three exercises, uh, anatomical parts, elements, and uh, cemetery contemplations, as in three uh, 
combined ways really undermining central aspects of attachment and craving, and this counterbalance towards any kind of negativity with this emphasis on the jhanas, on the physical experience, the bliss and happiness of jhanas. So the main point I suggest, and you are free to uh, suggest other main points uh, on the forum, uh, mindfulness of the body as a foundation of practice for tranquility and insight. So there's a question here from Akinchanon. Sefu Kwan in his book Mindfulness of Breathing, Mindfulness in Early Buddhism mentions several times that Kaya is not just body and backs this up with findings in the Ekotara Agama. Yeah, I have criticized Kwan in my new book. Shall I, I read all what you Kaya Rasati was not considered to be mindfulness of the physical body alone and Kaya obviously has a much broader sense in the physical body. In our case, Kaya Ka Sati or Kaya Kata Sati may refer to mindfulness applying to an individual that is able to perceive through his senses and is endowed with consciousness at the functional center of his experience. Thus, rather than a physical body, Kaya here must refer to sentient beings of a certain existence in the world of rebirth. And as far as I know, the Pali version of the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta is the only text in the earliest stratum of the canon that can support the interpretation of Kaya Gata Sati as mindfulness directed to the physical body. I wonder if you could comment on these things, Akinchanu. Yeah, first of all, lovely to have you here, Akinchanu. It's an old friend of mine. Uh, I, I find it totally unconvincing, but uh, he's a close friend of mine, Jeff, Sefu Kwan, but I find it totally unconvincing. And I think his basis is that he somehow starts from the assumption that the Madhyama Agama version must be original, which I think cannot be sustained. And uh, I have uh, written a short criticism in my new Sadipatana book of his theory. Basically, um, his argument is based on this, 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 what I briefly mentioned, this transmission of uh, passages from the Anguttara Nikaya, these two that have the reviewing sign and the perception of light. But he thinks that the passage that tells us about the benefit of body contemplation is also taken from there. And that makes no sense. The problem is that uh, the whole understanding of Kaya Gatasati that we have from all other passages is clearly on the body. So to take one Chinese version and then, because that has some exercises that can easily be shown to be an accident of all transmission, to revise that whole understanding that we have is rather drastic. And uh, Tsefu Kwan is, is, is a good scholar, but he doesn't meditate also. So I don't think he's also aware of the implications of his theory and I, I find it totally unconvincing. I have told him he has seen my criticism, and, and so he knows that I, 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 I disagree with him on that. We have still a little bit, so... Yeah, I think I want to get into... Uh, if you're not too tired, <laughs> you can't really say no, no. <laughs> because there's another uh, group of discourse I would like to take up next time, and next time will be our last time. And I expect there will be also some, I hope there will be also some interesting discussion on the forum. So I just get into the next uh, discourse, and I hope that stuffing this on top uh, will not uh, take away from what I said earlier. Which, which I, actually, what I said before is probably the most, for the practitioner, is probably the most important part of this course. And what comes now is not that, 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 that important. But I th think I still want to go a little bit ahead if you, if you're patient with me. Okay, this is the next discourse. And I am, uh, basically I'm gonna skip the introduction. And just tell you what happens. There's a monk called Chitta Hati Sariputta, and uh, a group of monks is sitting there and discussing, and he keeps interrupting and not waiting for the others to finish. And then Ma Kotita at a certain point takes him up and says, Look, uh, when others are talking, you have to wait for them to finish, and then only you should talk. And then this monk Chitta Hati Sariputta has some friends, and they say, Hey, Ma Kotita, 
you should not talk to him like this. He is a very good monk, and and uh, don't don't talk to him like this. And then uh, Venerable Mark Quantita says to these uh, 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 monks, and I think now we we get into the discourse. So <clears throat> at this, the Venerable Mark Quantita said to the friends of the monk Chittahapti Sariputta. Venerable friends, when who does not possess the knowledge of other minds cannot judge what is falsehood. Why? There may be a person who, while he is in the presence of the Blessed One and elder companions in the holy life, acts with humility in a manner that is endearing and reverential, being well restrained and well controlled. At a later time, however, when he has left the presence of the Blessed One and elder companions in the holy life, he abandons acting with humility and in a manner that is endearing and reverential. He associates much with lay disciples, makes fun, is conceited, and engages in all sorts of noisy talk. <laughs> As he associates much with lay disciples, makes fun, is conceited, and engages in all sorts of noisy talk, desire arises in his mind. Desire having arisen in his mind, the body and the mind become passionate. The body and the mind being passionate, he abandons the moral precepts and stops practicing the path. When your friends is just like an ox that has entered another's field. The guardian of the field catches it and ties it up with a rope or puts it inside a fence. When your friends, if someone were to say this ox will not again enter another's fields, would that be correctly spoken? And they reply, no, why not? That ox might break or undo the rope with which it is bound, or it might break or get out of the fence with which it is kept and again enter another's field, just as before. <clears throat> so this is the first illustration of somebody who, when seniors are around, behaves very nicely, but as soon as nobody is watching, he does, or she, does whatever she wants. And now we get a similar type of description for people who have attained an absorption. Again, we are with the discourse. There may be a person who attains the first absorption. Having attained the first absorption, he dwells at peace in himself and does not strive further with the wish to attain what has not yet been attained, to gain what has not been gained, to realize what has not been realized. At a later time, he associates much with lay disciples, etc. The whole thing we had before makes fun, desires invade the mind, and eventually gives up. Monkut. And now we get a simile. It is just as at the time of much rain, a village pond is full of water. Earlier one could see sand, stones, vegetation, beetles, fish, turtles, toads, and all kinds of water-dwelling creatures, as they went back and forth, moved around or remained still. Later, when it is full of water, one can no longer see them. When your friends, if someone were to say, in this lake, one will never again see sand, stones, vegetation, beetles, fish, turtles, toads, and all kinds of water-dwelling creatures, as they go back and forth, move about or remain still, would they be correctly spoken? And they reply, no. Why not? Elephants might drink from the water of that pond, horses, camels, cows, donkeys, pigs, deer, or water buffalo might drink water from it. People might take water from it for their use, the wind might blow on it, and the sun dry it up. Even if one not earlier see sand, stones, vegetation, beetles, fish, turtles, toads, and all kinds of water-dwelling creatures, as they went back and forth, moved about, or remained still, later, when the water has become diminished, one sees them again, just as before. So this image describes someone who has attained the first absorption, and by not continuing to practice further, he is in a situation where in this image the defilements or the sandstone and vegetation are not clearly visible, but as time goes by, they surface again. Now the second absorption, and just a simile, it is just as at a time of much rain, all of the dust at a crossroads becomes mud. <coughs> Venerable friends, if someone were to say the mud at this crossroads will never dry out, it will not become dust again, would that be correctly spoken? And they reply, no. Why not? Elephants may cross this crossroads, or horses, camels, cows, donkeys, pigs, deer, water buffalo. 
people may cross this crossroads, the wind will blow on it and the sun will dry it out. The mud that the crossroads having dried up will again become dust. Third absorption, just a simile. It is just like a lake fed by water from a mountain spring which is clear and pure with level shores, still without fluctuation and without waves. Venerable friends, if someone were to say that lake fed by water from a mountain spring will never again fluctuate, will not have any waves, would that be correctly spoken? No, why not? A great wind may suddenly come from the eastern direction and blow on the water of that lake, stirring up waves. In the same way, a great wind may suddenly come from the southern direction, from the western direction, from the northern direction, blow on the water of that lake, stirring up waves. And fourth absorption. Similarly, it is just as a householder or a householder's son eats delicious food until he has had his fill. Early he wanted to eat, but now he does not want to eat any more. Venerable friends, if someone were to say that householder or householder's son will never again want to get food, would they be correctly spoken? No, why not? That householder or householder's son will become hungry again overnight. If he early had no use for food, later he will again want to get it. And after the four absorptions, we also get the signless concentration of the mind, animitta chetu samadhi. And here's the simile <coughs> which gives the title to the discourse. It's just as in a forest one may hear the sound of crickets. If the king or the king's great minister stay overnight in that forest, then there will be the sound of elephants, horses, chariots, people walking, conchs, drums, slim waisted drums, side drums, dancing, singing, lutes, drinking and eating. The sound of crickets that could early be heard can no longer be heard. Venerable friends, if one were to say, in this forest one will never again hear the sound of crickets, would that be correctly spoken? They replied, no. Why not? Having stayed overnight at dawn, the king and the king's great minister will each return to his place. The sounds that one could hear of elephants, horses, chariots, people walking, Conch, drums, slim waisted drums, side drums, dancing, singing, lutes, drinking and eating, because of which one could not hear the sound of cricking will all have disappeared, and one will hear the crickets again just as earlier. So after all these similes, <coughs> then the story continues that Chittahati Sariputta indeed has given up the life as a monk and stopped practicing. And the friends of uh, Hatta Sariputta, then, uh, uh, when they find out, they come to Markotita and they ask him if he had knowledge of the mind of Chitta Hatta Sariputta, that he knew that this was going to happen. And then Markotita says, When we're friends, it was bound to happen just like this. Why? Because he does not know things as they really are, does not see things as they really are. Why? just because of not knowing things as they really are, not seeing things as they really are. So, difference here in the allocation of the similes. So, the first jhana, the, the well behavior in both versions is like an ox that has been bound, but the jhana similes are different. The first jhana is a village pond in the Madhyama Agama but dust in the Anguttara and the second is then opposite and again the similes for the third and fourth jhana mountain lake and meal are opposite sequence again we get this difference in sequence the signlessness in all versions are crickets the sound of crickets and um, signless concentration is uh, signlessness is an aspect of nirvana but a signless concentration as such is not necessarily the attainment of nirvana. There's a very good article by Peter Harvey on this for anybody who wants to follow it up. And in terms of differences with the Pali version, two things I should mention in the Anguttara Nikaya version. Mahakotita says that he knew about the condition of Chitta also because he was told by Devas. Gods have told him. This is not there in the Chinese. And the Anguttarnikai also has a happy end, happy end because after some time Chitta goes forth again as a monk and eventually becomes an Arahant. This is also not 
uh, reported in the Chinese version. And the main point of this discourse, as far as I understand, is that uh, with all the recommendation that is given to jhana practice, it should be clear that the final goal is full liberation. And that the purpose of any kind of deep concentration uh, is to lead onwards to that, because concentration as such, however deep it is, however much power it can give, is something that uh, does not, is, is not the safe way out. So, five minutes over time, I think that was excusable. I hope it was acceptable. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion in the forum. And next time is our last time. There's three more discourses, but these are all fairly short, so should we should be able to get through the whole thing. And I specifically appreciate if during the actual lecture you put in questions. That makes it a little bit more lively for all of us. Have a nice week, and until next week.